very much for giving me the opportunity to present my, um, my work on the uh, adaptive dynamics be behind the use of alternative medicine. Um, as an evolutionary biologist, I, am, I was absolutely puzzled by the continuing and, in fact, increasing popularity uh, of alternative medicine. This is data um, collected from uh, individuals in the United States uh, showing the increasing popularity of, uh, of alternative medicine use. Um, alternative medicine, of course, defined by Tim Minchin famously as um, medicine that I has either not been proved to work or been proved not to work. Um, <laughs> And if we assume that uh, before there was any evidence-based medicine, all medicine was alternative medicine, according to this definition, and we then fit a curve to that data, <laughs> we, we see that this, the point at which the decrease, the expected decrease, stops and in fact reverses, uh, correlates quite nicely with the increasing availability of vaccines as well as antibiotics. And, and herein, I think, uh, lies the solution to this problem. Um, I propose here that uh, alternative medicine is stimulated by bacteria and viruses. <laughs> Pathogens have evolved to protect themselves to this very real uh, danger of increasing medical advance uh, by being able to uh, detect and respond to the use of alternative medicine and in fact manipulate their hosts into using this. Um, this is a very adaptive phenotype and the following thought experiment will, will demonstrate that. If we look at a, a normal infection, uh, after the primary infection the bacterium grows um, increases in population size inside their host until it finds a new one. However, if this, um, with the increase of population size, of course, increases the chance that the, the uh, uh, infection is detected by the host, who can then foil the plans of the pathogen by seeking treatment. If he seeks treatment by taking an antibiotic, he might actually kill all of the pathogens and break the cycle. However, in case this host chooses a placebo, um, there's an option that, of course, it doesn't work. It's a placebo. Um, if this is the case, eventually the host will decide to find a proper treatment. But in case a bacterium or another uh, pathogen is able to detect the use of this placebo and respond to it accordingly, you will see that the placebo, um, uh, the uh, Transmission is, the bacteria is able to transmit to a following generation because the host will be prevented from actually seeking the proper medical treatment. This is, of course, the preventing of eradication is, of course, a highly adaptive phenotype, and we will therefore have expected it to evolve repeatedly um, in many, many different human pathogens. Um, the way this pathway works is actually twofold. First, um, the pathogen detects that he's infected a gullible, a gullible host. Um, with, this, with this detection come the, is, and then it's primed to look out for cues of the use of a placebo. Uh, then it will sense the quorum, which is something that is very well established in science. So bacteria are re repeatedly shown to be able to detect the size of their population and uh, therefore adequately respond to the use of the placebo. Um, and this use, of course, increases the gullibility of the host. <laughs> now, it, it is notoriously difficult to research uh, the mechanisms of this because of the very A-specific nature of the response uh, which makes it very difficult to control for. But what we can look at is the output of the system as a whole, which is, of course, the host output or the internet. Um, <laughs> humans are um, known to sh want to share their experiences, and, of course, the experience of being healed by acupuncture is no exception. Um, and we, um, when they do this sharing the experience on the internet, we can actually measure that. We looked for uh, the combination of all kinds of human pathogens, 
both bacteria and viruses, as well as six different specifically chosen uh, alternative therapies, um, and checked and scored for the uh, total amount of search results that they gave. That they gave. Um, the results that you will see that we'll present in a minute will look uh, as follows. So you have a species and then a bar graph indicating the, the number of responses that that particular combination of pathogen and therapy gave. Now, of course, what we are looking for is if there's any particular bias um, that is provided by the biology of this pathogen to detect a certain type of therapy. And if we see that we put the, the threshold for this at 35%. So if there is over, if the research results for one type of therapy um, is over 35% of the total search results for that pathogen, we call the pathogen a specialist, and we will color the bar um, as such. Um, this is the... Uh, <laughs> These are, these are the results for bacteria. I will shortly present the results for viruses, but first for bacteria, what we see is very interesting. So first of all, we see that most bacteria actually are generalists. They are reported to respond to a wide variety of therapies. Um, and um, at probably the ancestor of all bacteria was one that was uh, particularly able to detect the signs of use of osteopathy. However, in the line to Bacilli and Clostridium, something happened that allowed that particular clade to be particularly tuned to um, the signs of aromatherapy, which is an interesting observation. And then there are a couple of further specialists, but because they're single ones, I will not address them right now. Um, looking at viruses and looking at the same thing, we find, first of all, that viruses seem to be much more able to detect sound therapy and yoga. Um, <laughs> Especially, especially single-strand RNA viruses seem to be very uh, capable of detecting the signs of, of yoga use. Um, aromatherapy again pops up as something that double-stranded both DNA and RNA viruses are, are uh, very able to detect. Um, and of course, what I, what I noticed first when I looked at this data is actually that the three therapies that seem to be most specialized in are actually probably therapies that or, or provide cues um, that could be engaged in by humans regardless of their infection status. Um, and therefore, they would provide a, a, a very good uh, clues for the bacteria that they have infected a gullible phenotype, for example, frequent or prol and prolonged axis inversion or purposeless manipulations of muscles and joints um, or the frequent respiratory intake of patchouli. <laughs> so, yeah, so we provide, we, we um, assume from this that these are therapies that are much more um, pr playing a role much more strongly in the detection of the gullible phenotype. Um, now, in, in an uh, upcoming study, we will go into much more detail about the biological significance of these species-specific uh, detection biases. Uh, but for now, I'd like, you with one, would like to leave you for, with one last observation, which is that the general response of all, um, all species that we found is actually quite cross-specific. So they seem to respond, um, they seem to cr respond across the board to all kinds of different therapies, which is actually lies at the heart. So this cross-specificity lies at the heart of, uh, our, of our um, hypothesis. And it not only explains the uh, use of alternative medicine, but it also explains the quite baffling, uh, very maladaptive trend of um, uh, anti-vaccination movement. <laughs> and with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. <laughs>